ladies and gentlemen, the 39th president of the Western Thoracic Surgical Association, Mike Mulligan. Thank you, John. Thank you very, very much. Before I begin, I would like to thank, thank some individuals who made it possible for me to be here today. John Mitchell has already mentioned some, and I apologize for those that I do not have time to mention. I am privileged to be part of the finest cardiothoracic team on the planet. The surgeons, fellows, nurses, coordinators, and staff that I work with have created an environment that is supportive, fun, and dynamic. Our shared success is a source of great pride and satisfaction. Carlos Pellegrini has been my chair, mentor, and teacher like no other. He has challenged me and supported me in ways that were essential to my development and growth. Ed Verrier is a kindred spirit whose passion and dedication have been my example. He walked many paths before me and has been an indispensable advisor. Doug Wood is a tremendous leader in our specialty. He has been my partner for nearly 16 years. The synergy in that partnership and that friendship are unmatched and have fostered a deep and lasting bond. Father Patrick Freetag helped me guide me through a period of desolation and adversity. He challenged me to rebuild myself in the most fundamental ways. My father taught me about honesty, integrity, and commitment. Anything less than your best effort is not acceptable. He taught me all these things by his example. He is my role model. It was my mother that instilled in me the belief that I could do something extraordinary with my life. She never wavered and remains my most enthusiastic supporter. When my boys, Michael and Connor, were born, I wanted to do everything better especially as a husband and father, because they deserve a special role model too. I marvel at their intellect, talents, athleticism, faith, and character. They are wonderful boys who will grow to be inspiring men. Lisa, my wife of 25 years, is still my girlfriend. She is beautiful, strong, independent, brilliant, and wonderfully comfortable in who she is. She is also my most honest advisor and unflinching defender. With all that I have committed to do, she makes our life possible. Everyone I have helped in my career owes her a debt of gratitude for her patience, commitment, and support. And finally, my dog Rex who's had to listen to me give this speech more than anyone else in the household. <laughs> in transition, I would be remiss if I failed to publicly acknowledge four individuals who helped me with my research and preparation for today's talk. Scott Chappelle is a world-renowned human factors engineer and performance analyst at Embry-Riddle. Yuri Wagner's is a professor of aeronautical engineering at UW and a Hall of Fame ski instructor. Connie Weibel is a celebrated pianist and musicologist. And Doug Newberg is a performance coach who served on the medical school faculty at the University of Virginia for 15 years. He, more than anyone, helped me find my voice for this talk. Discussing a topic like this feels somewhat risky because it strays from the constraints of academic convention. However, my experience with challenges that I have faced over the last three and a half years and research that I have done have convinced me that this is an important topic. Allow me to begin with a question to each of you. Does how you feel influence how you perform? If you answered yes, then I suspect you'll find something of value in my remarks. I will frame my talk by asking three additional questions. The first is, how do you need to feel to perform well? I am at my best when I am in flow. 
Flow has been described by some as being in the zone or having the hot hand. Olympic backstroke gold medalist Jeff Rouse described the phenomenon as easy speed. A state of focused, relaxed, high efficiency where an 85% effort yields 100% of maximum speed. In surgery, we experience this when our hands seem to move deftly with no wasted movement. Needles travel exactly where we want them to go, and it feels almost as if we're watching ourselves operate with a tremendous sense of satisfaction. Mahali Csikszentmihalyi describes flow in his landmark book as the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will often do it at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. There's often a sense of being outside of everyday reality. Great inner clarity is achieved knowing what needs to be done, fully confident that our skills are up to the task at hand. Often we are unaware of time passing. Hours feel like minutes. And most importantly, the experience itself provides intrinsic motivation. Whatever we are doing in flow becomes its own reward. The quality of our lives fundamentally depends on the quality of our experiences. The best moments of our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times. Rather, our best moments come when we are stretched to our limits to accomplish something difficult, something of value. Surgery is a field that encourages the experience of flow. Parameters that promote flow include defined goals, particularly those associated with a significant challenge, participation in activities that require a higher level of skill, availability of clear feedback, and a keen self-awareness. These conditions are present in abundance in our profession. Challenges are numerous and great skill is required to meet them. Consider this diagram. Flow is represented by the blue pie. Skill is depicted on one axis and challenge along the other. When we are a bit more confident that our skills are more than adequate to handle the task at hand, we experience control. Control is good because we feel comfortable. However, to achieve flow in surgery, one needs challenges that require you to find a higher level of functioning or discrete improvement. In arousal, we are perhaps less confident that our skills are quite up to the task. High performers, indeed, prefer, prefer to spend the majority of their time in one of these three states, and ideally, flow. Individuals who seek flow experiences also demonstrate a deliberate openness to novelty. Such individuals are not necessarily happier but are definitely more involved in complex activities, which in turn make them feel better about themselves and subsequently increases their self-esteem. Surgeons with this predisposition remain self-critical throughout their careers and seek paths to acquire new skills, innovate, and enhance performance. Consider looking at the pulmonary hyalur anatomy from as many different perspectives as possible. Practicing a variety of dissection sequences will allow one to encounter an unanticipated challenge and flow to an efficient, safe, and optimal completion. In athletics, this could be described as expanding the size of one's proprioceptive envelope. Skier Bodie Miller has a conditioning regimen that includes loading a wheelbarrow unevenly with rocks and charging up uneven terrain. This forces him not only to build strength and agility, but to react to ever-changing conditions. Such a willingness to throw yourself out of balance inevitably trains you to efficiently recover it in times of intense and unpredictable demand. My second question for you is, if you know how you need to feel, what gets in the way of that feel? Injuries and physical breakdown certainly can. For years, I experienced flow in the operating room nearly every day 
without conscious behavior to encourage its appearance. Change occurred suddenly with injuries and required an immediate and comprehensive response. I was thrust into new territory and forced to examine this topic in an effort to try to rediscover my flow. However, we are all aging and the threats to flow are inevitable. At the age of 35 and facing death, Mozart said, I am finished before I enjoyed my talent. As we gain knowledge and experience, we are unfortunately growing older at the same time. Our most seasoned and insightful surgeons are therefore forced to face physical limitations that are often the result of wear and tear from a life spent standing in the operating room. Therefore, we need to be more thoughtful about behaviors that more specifically preserve the appearance of flow as we move through our careers. Fatigue also impairs performance and threatens flow experiences. Sleep loss negatively affects learning capacity, memory consolidation, mood, cognition, coordination, reaction times, and tolerance for stress. This has been specifically examined in healthcare worker performance. After one 24-hour period of wakefulness, imagine that you've been operating all night and now you have an elective list of cases facing you, your cognitive and physical performance are at best 85% of your baseline. Stated differently, your functionality is equivalent to that associated with a blood alcohol level of 0.1%. Remember that the legal limit is 0.08%. Successive nights of four hours of sleep or less have been shown to have a demonstrable functional impact. After just four such nights, perhaps you've had a tough week of emergencies and transplants, your functional efficiency drops to approximately 50%. Such a phenomenon associated with successive nights of sleep restriction is referred to as sleep debt and usually requires two full nights of sleep to fully recover. Such surgical marathons are ill-advised. Your performance will definitely suffer. Flow is unlikely to appear. Stress management will be impaired and patient outcomes will be threatened. Operating late at night also impedes flow and impairs performance. Performance and alertness vary greatly with circadian rhythm. Function begins to deteriorate after 10 p.m. and is not fully recovered until 10 a.m. the next day. Our performance is at its worst between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. This is referred to as the circadian trough. As people age, their circadian rhythms shift to earlier in the day. Knowing this, the effects of off-hours operating are felt to an even greater degree by our more senior surgeons. I acknowledge that there are times when late night operating is unavoidable. However, if timing of operation can be managed, we might do a better job of enhancing surgical performance. Adjusting donor OR times to optimize timing of complex recipient operations would be an excellent example. A study is planned at the Medical University of South Carolina wherein human factors engineers will measure human error and performance during heart transplant operations done during the night or during the day. The difference in performance and threats to patient safety are measurable and real. Workflow breaks are also detrimental. That same group of human factors engineers recently observed 10 cardiac operations. They looked at flow breaks or disruptions to process from the time the patient was wheeled into the room to the time that they were wheeled out. During those 10 cases, 1,080 flow breaks were observed. The largest category of disruptions related to poor communication or extraneous information coming into the environment that did not directly relate to the case being performed. Imagine that while you're trying to operate, an intern comes in to give report to your fellow. A coordinator is trying to text a cell phone in your pocket to tell you about a donor organ offer. A call comes in to remind you that your 1.30 appointment is waiting in your office. And in the meantime, your anesthesiologist has just left the room and you're trying to explain to the junior resident how and when to administer medications that you need to have in just before the cross clamp comes off. 
The human brain can process approximately 110 bits of information per second. Conversation with a single individual occupies 60 bits per second. This is why we cannot carry on two conversations at once. Clearly, we need to simplify our focus and sharpen it in order to unlock our optimal performance. Finally, while self-awareness is required, self-consciousness is distractive. While we need to know whether our skills and insights are adequate to the task at hand, preoccupation with external perception of our skills or abilities is counterproductive. The surgeon's confidence is centrally important to the dynamic of his team and their cooperative flow. Stated simply, optimal performance requires an uncluttered feel for what we are doing in the moment. However, preoccupation with how we feel about what we are doing is detrimental. The third question I have for you is, how do we get that feel back? You can't stop aging, but you can slow its effects. Step out of your demanding schedule to invest in the preservation of your overall health and well-being. Surgery is a very physical profession. Toughing it out and ignoring your ailments will invariably lead to progressive degradation of your surgical performance. The impact will manifest for your patients, your team, and your family. It may also require that you create ways to work around your changing physical state. As Beethoven lost his hearing, he began placing his head near the soundboard so he could feel the music. He stopped performing and conducting, but continued to compose. Later, he had the legs removed from his piano and laid on the floor to better feel the vibrations. Some of his most memorable work, including the Ninth Symphony, was completed when he was profoundly deaf. Rather than mourn the changes we encounter with age, celebrate ways to persevere. You may also have to adapt the way flow is experienced. In the context of the more senior surgeon, consider experiencing flow by intensifying your teaching. If you want to make your mark in the specialty, you have to do more than just operate well. You must take all the unique knowledge and insight that you've developed and teach it back into the pool so that you can effectively raise the tide of understanding to a level higher than when you entered the field. Make it an absolute imperative to impart all the knowledge that you've accumulated over your career, especially the, little, especially the little moves that you've learned from years of experience that are not captured in a book or manuscript. It takes focus to recognize what you know and then reach back and teach it to those who have come to you to learn. I assure you, it's worth it. Immediately following the reattachment of my bicep, I was unable to use my right hand. I had to talk surgeons and fellows through lung transplant operations. I conveyed all the things I learned through experience, all the reasoning behind every move that led to greater accuracy and efficiency. It was exhausting. But my team said that these were the best educational experiences that any of them had ever had. These were also profound flow experiences for all of us. Most extraneous communication that causes a workflow break can easily be redirected or managed by someone else on the team. Minimizing workflow breaks requires that you organize your team thoughtfully and consistently. Encourage ownership and pride in your team so that they can manage parts of the process themselves. When you've established this culture, you will no longer have to manage everything that's happening in your OR. You can simplify your focus to how you feel and attend to what you need to do in the moment. Simplification also relates to the way we teach. Rather than overload residents and fellows with rapid fire corrections, try to identify singular corrective interventions that unlock a favorable chain of performance gains. In Harvey Pennock's Little Red Book on Golf, the chapter on putting is three words long. Take dead aim. Thinking about too many things at once will ultimately result in performance breakdown. Simplification and insightful targeting are critical. 
We must pursue approaches to instruction that are consolidative to unlock flow. Let me also address the notion of why we teach residents to work with two hands. Obviously, an idle hand is not productive to the conduct of an operation, but there is a relevant psychomotor concept that may help unlock better performance. Excessive focus on single-handed tasks strangles flow. I learned this lesson from a musicologist and piano teacher. I began taking lessons in an effort to try to elevate my performance in both hands. Keyboard players know that when two hands are executing tasks that are different but complementary, both hands manifest enhanced relaxation and greater efficiency of movement. This is true in surgery as well. This is likely due in part to the fact that more complex tasks require more of your bandwidth to complete, leaving less available to be preoccupied by thoughts of how we are doing. This phenomenon can be generalized by seeking greater challenges. It is human nature to divert attention to feelings about what we are doing if we are not sufficiently challenged. When challenges are sufficient to require all of your skill and fully occupy our attention, flow is more likely to occur. To feel the way we need to for optimal performance, it is critical to set our focus before we begin. It may also require resetting later in the case. There is a certain tenor to the dissective portions of our operations. Consider the intensity, even the aggression that is required for a complex reoperative dissection. Contrast that with the calm, deliberate focus necessary for sewing an anastomosis with fine proline suture. To facilitate such transitions, consider taking a brief pause between the dissective and reconstructive elements of your surgeries. In 2003, lightning interrupted a Seattle Seahawks game in the first quarter at Century League Field. The teams were sent to their locker rooms. Quarterback Russell Wilson decided to shower and dress in a fresh uniform. He reset or reprogrammed himself as he was starting the game anew. The Seahawks went on to soundly defeat the San Francisco 49ers, and now Mr. Wilson makes this a regular habit at halftime. Change your gown and gloves. Put on a fresh uniform, if you will. Get a drink of water, just pause for a few breaths, before moving on to the next phase of an operation. I believe in the value of music in the operating room. It has been shown to mask unpleasant sounds and feelings and can slow down and synchronize brain waves. Appropriately selected music can enhance the appearance of alpha waves and theta waves that are known to correlate with periods of peak creativity, relaxation, contentment, and a sense of peace. It can create a dynamic balance between the more logical left and the more intuitive right hemispheres. This is the basis of creativity. Carefully selected music has also been shown to reduce muscle tension and improve body movement and coordination. Of course, the type of music selected is critically important. Music that is unpleasant to the listener adds a sense of dissonance and stress. The music that you select for a certain portion of an operation should have an associated emotional content that's desirable and appropriate. For example, the music of Elvis Presley has been shown to stimulate active movement, release tension, and reduce the effects of other loud and unpleasant sounds in the environment. It can also create tension if you're not in the mood to be energetically entertained. As I said, we all need different types of music for different portions of operations. It all gets back to controlling your environment to optimize how you feel. As I stated earlier, to feel our best and encourage optimal performance, we must be keenly self-aware, but eliminate self-consciousness. We need to focus on our feel for what is happening in the operating room and disregard our feelings about how we are performing. Such notions do not add value in the moment. One way to move away from self-consciousness is to operate under the rubric of detachment. These children at the Cove Alliance Catholic Orphanage in Uganda are utterly content, even joyful, at play. They have no thoughts of being judged while they play and care not for wealth, power, or honor. 
Many of us are preoccupied with how others perceive us and how much power and influence we can amass. Perhaps this is why J.R.R. Tolkien proposes the most tempting talisman, a ring of power. But such thoughts are counterproductive to optimal performance. To experience flow, we need to evolve to a state more detached, more akin to play. Friedrich Nietzsche describes three steps in the development of the human spirit. In the first, we take on the burden of cultural duties. In the second, the human psyche rebels against slavish obedience to authority. And finally, the highest level of humanity is unburdened and creative, symbolized as the child at play. Picasso was quoted as saying, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. There's another form of detachment that may be of value to you when you face great challenges in the operating room. In his book, Do No Harm, British neurosurgeon Henry Marsh describes why he avoids seeing patients on the morning of their operations. I prefer not to be reminded of their humanity and their fear. I do not want them to know that I too am anxious. Once he is in the operating room and the patient, largely hidden behind monitors, drapes, and equipment, has transformed from a person to an object, his own state of mind undergoes a similar sort of change. The dread is gone and has been replaced by a fierce and happy concentration. Finally, let's consider how the experience of flow may vary throughout the phases of one's surgical career. As residents and fellows, we learn the mechanics of proper operating and decision making. The process is broken down and repeated over and over again until it begins to gel. It requires 10,000 repetitions of skilled tasks to become an expert. Much like the swimmer in a laned pool, we practice for years until efficiency and performance are optimized. It is difficult to experience flow during this training phase, but it does happen. When we become seasoned attendings, we hit our stride. We can deal with complex cases and rapidly evolving challenges with confidence and exhilaration. The lane markers are removed and the walls of the pool will come down. Now you're swimming, even surfing in the ocean. Despite the waves and currents, we are confident. However, as we become more senior, we accept a greater number of responsibilities and commitments, some of them dissipative. At this point, when we should experience our best performance and maximal benefit to others, we can become overburdened with multitasking and begin, in, and begin to run into debris in the water. It is critical at this junction to simplify and clarify, to clean the water, if you will. We do not have infinite capacity. Although the ego drives us to excel and accept a seemingly endless list of responsibilities, we would do better if we were more selective. As the Chinese philosopher Ai Ching said, unlimited possibilities are not suited to man. If they existed, his life would only dissolve into the boundless. To become strong, a man's life needs limitations, ordained by duty and voluntarily accepted. Simplify, focus. We cannot be all things to all people, but must be fully committed to those who have entrusted us. And perhaps this is my cautionary note about flow. <clears throat> Initially conceived as a path to optimal personal experience, we cannot accept such a selfish or narcissistic definition. <clears throat> Our time and flow must have meaning to others as well, meaning that resonates deeply inside everyone involved. <clears throat> we must be inclusive of team members, our patients, and the families that support us. By all means, enjoy the privilege that we have of doing extraordinary things in the operating room and do them to the very best of your ability. 
Optimize your experience, but do so with reverence and respect. Thank you.